The ghostly bluish glow surrounding operating nuclear reactors is known as Vavilov-Cherenkov radiation. It occurs when charged particles, such as protons and electrons, travel through a medium at a speed exceeding the speed of light in that medium. Why is the speed of light, or more precisely, the speed of electromagnetic radiation in a medium, less than the speed of light in a vacuum? We discussed this in one of our previous videos, so we won't dwell on it now. What's important is that this is fundamentally possible. For example, in water, the phase velocity of an electromagnetic wave is about only 75% of the speed of light in a vacuum. On the other hand, nuclear processes often produce charged particles moving at much higher speeds. The speed of electrons released during beta decay, for instance, can reach 99.8% of the speed of light in a vacuum. When particles travel through a medium at speeds exceeding the phase velocity of light in that medium, the medium emits electromagnetic radiation. This effect is what we call Vavilov-Cherenkov radiation. You might have heard about this many times on other science popularization channels, but I personally couldn't find a clear explanation of the physical nature of Cherenkov radiation on YouTube. So, I'll try to fill that gap with this video because explaining the essence of various physical processes and phenomena is exactly what we do on our channel. So let's delve into the nature of Cherenkov radiation, and I propose approaching the solution from this angle. As we know, any electromagnetic radiation is essentially a flow of energy. In our case, the source of radiation is the medium through which fast-moving charged particles propagate, and for this medium to emit something, it must somehow acquire energy. The source of this energy is obviously the kinetic energy of the charged particles. And to understand the nature of Vavilov-Cherenkov radiation, we essentially need to understand the nature of the mechanism by which the kinetic energy of charged particles is transferred to the medium. And this mechanism should work only when the speed of the charged particles exceeds the phase velocity of electromagnetic waves in the medium. To do this, we need to remember what any medium consists of and how this medium reacts to charged particles and the electric field in general. Matter, for example, water, consists of molecules, molecules consist of atoms, and atoms consist of a positively charged nucleus at the center and negatively charged electrons on the periphery. For simplicity, we'll consider not molecules, but the atoms that make up these molecules. This doesn't change the essence of the matter, and it will be much easier to illustrate. We will also depict the atoms correctly. We will not show electrons orbiting the nucleus like planets around the sun, but as electron clouds distributed around the nucleus. Let's consider a group of atoms among which there is a charged particle, say, a negatively charged electron. First, let's assume that this electron is stationary. The electric field created by the electron will attract positively charged atomic nuclei and repel negatively charged electrons. This results in what physicists call the polarization of atoms. While remaining electrically neutral, they turn into electric dipoles with a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. The electric field created by these polarized atoms will then affect our electron, which will start to be attracted to the polarized atoms. The atoms on different sides of the electron will pull it in different directions with equal force meaning the electron itself will not feel any inclination to move in a specific direction within the medium. Let's complicate the task and imagine that the electron is moving through the medium. When the electron is far from a specific atom, its field's effect on the atom is weak and polarization is almost absent, so the atom won't act on the electron. As the electron approaches, the atom polarizes more and when the electron passes by and moves away, the atom gradually returns to its normal state, restoring its unpolarized state. Thus, as the electron flies through the substance, the atoms it approaches begin to attract it more strongly, while the atoms it moves away from attract it less. As a result, the net force of attraction from all the atoms will also be zero, meaning the substance won't impede the electron's movement through it except in cases where the electron, for example, crashes into one of the atoms. But we aren't interested in such cases now, as they generate their own effects unrelated to Cherenkov radiation. Now let's see what happens when an electron moves through the substance at a speed exceeding the speed of light. 
Recall that the speed of light is nothing more than the speed at which the electromagnetic field propagates in the medium, i.e. the speed at which information about an electron traveling in their direction reaches distant atoms, causing them to start polarizing under its field. If at subluminal speeds, this information propagates through the medium faster than the electron moves, and the polarization of atoms when the electron approaches and their depolarization as it passes by will proceed roughly symmetrically at superluminal speeds, the symmetry will break. The atoms the electron is approaching won't feel its electric field in time and will remain unpolarized. Thus, the net force of attraction acting on the electron from the atoms will no longer be zero. The atoms behind the electron will attract it more strongly than the atoms ahead of it, meaning the electron traveling through the substance at superluminal speed will experience a force directed against its motion, a decelerating force. The result of this force will be a reduction in the electron's speed and hence its kinetic energy. But according to the law of conservation of energy, this energy cannot simply disappear. It must somehow be transferred to the medium. So, we have found what we needed, a mechanism for transferring the kinetic energy of charged particles to the medium when these particles move through the medium at superluminal speed. This energy is evidently stored as the potential energy of electrostatic interaction between the electron and the atomic nucleus within the atom, which the atom acquires during its polarization. This is similar to how a stretched spring stores energy. If we stretch and slowly release the spring, it just returns to its equilibrium state, and something similar happens in the atom as the electron passes by at a slow speed. However, if we stretch the spring and release it sharply, the spring begins to oscillate, and the same thing happens with an atom when an electron passes by at a significant speed. But in our atomic spring, charged objects oscillate, and the oscillatory and any accelerated motion of charged objects, as we mentioned in one of our previous videos, always generates electromagnetic radiation, through which oscillating charged systems radiate the energy of oscillatory motion into the surrounding medium. And the result of this radiation is Cherenkov radiation. It should be noted that the resulting Cherenkov radiation generated by the medium will represent the interference of waves created by each atom in the medium. The result of this interference will be that Cherenkov radiation will propagate in the form of a cone with the particle at its vertex, and the cone angle will depend on the particle's speed. So by measuring this angle, we can quite accurately calculate the particle's speed. These properties of Cherenkov radiation have found practical applications. For example, in Cherenkov detectors, where they measure the speed and kinetic energy of high energy particles from cosmic rays. But what cosmic rays are, and how and why we study them, we will discuss in one of our future videos. For now, that's all for today. Goodbye, dear friends, and see you next time.